So it's a pre-welcome. Uh, it is. Uh, we are waiting for the clock. Yeah, it's six o'clock now. It's six o'clock, so we can begin. Well, good evening to one and all who all are watching us, and good evening to Mr. Sainat. Well, uh, you know that uh, we are in the first session of a series, hundred and still counting the new life. This series is uh, a discussion, a discussion on the reality, the ground reality which we are facing, the lockdown and uh, COVID situation, how to cope with it. There will be several discussions on this. And today you can see who is with us, uh, who does not require any introduction. Mr. P. Sainath, one of the most renowned journalists uh, of the country. And I'm Snehashish, Snehashish Shur. I also happen to be a journalist, but let me tell you, I have been working in mainstream media for the last three decades, but today it gives me an additional pleasure that as a professional journalist, I have interviewed many statesmen uh, here and outside the country, but today I am going to interview or I'm going to join and facilitate the discussion of a very renowned uh, journalist whom we all adore and respect, Mr. P. Sainath. He is not only the Maxisse award-winning journalist uh, by which most of us know, but he is one journalist who speaks of Bharat, the rural India. This is his belief. This is his faith. And he wants to mainstream this rural life. Uh, he wants to put it to the rest of India, what is happening there. He has also got an international award on human rights, which is also a very prestigious award. He has been the rural affairs editor of the Hindu, and now he has started his own experiment, which is Pari People's Archive of Rural India. He is documenting the life of rural India and presenting before uh, the rest of the country. I believe that uh, when we discuss about the profession, we always say that the people are our most important factor. But when we write or say something on television or radio, we miss them. Where are our people? He is one who always uh, take people along and uh, he always uh, would like to highlight the life of the people. And his book, famous book on the drought, uh, is uh, read, well read. And this is 43rd edition of Penguin. So where he has documented about the system, the poor remains poor, and everything is there, uh, everything is issued, but it doesn't reach them. So we have uh, this uh, great personality who is who has dedicated himself for rural India, uh, especially my dear friends uh, who are committed or who are aspiring to be journalists. Please uh, listen to a person who has committed himself for Bharat, for rural India. And I'll be failing in my duty if I do not mention that this entire episode and the entire series is brought to you by DCAST, uh, a communication endeavor, communication initiative by a handful of uh, students who studied uh, journalism and mass communication in Vishwavarati University. And uh, some of them are still studying. They have interned with PARI. And the most importantly, I must say that when there is a job shrink of mainstream journalism, they have started what quote unquote we say startup, but they are excelled themselves in digital platforms and they are working uh, on the digital platform and facilitating all these uh, about a holistic communication. So congratulations to you and welcome again to all our uh, watchers and listeners. I don't know how to address you. It is because of you that we find this is going to be uh, an useful one. And uh, Mr. Sainath, I have no words to thank you. You are so busy. You have been just uh, in a meeting, a uh, similar meeting with the uh, farmers it's, uh, themselves, whom uh, you love most. And now you are there for the aspiring journalists or students or common people. Uh, yes, uh, other topic for the session is basically online education, offline chaos. The problem of education in this situation and uh, digital divide and what how the students will cope their anxiety and how the teachers will reorient themselves all these will come 
But I think having Mr. P. Sai Nath online present with us and not beginning our discussion with his experience of rural India of COVID and lockdown will not be befitting. So we'll initially begin our discussion on his reactions, his analysis on the ground realities of rural India as uh, uh, in a COVID situation and in a lockdown situation. And then we will switch over to uh, education, what we have said online and offline. And then we would like to know something on the party experiment, uh, which he has been spearheading. We need to know how digitally he is enabling them and documenting them. And then you are most welcome to give your questions. We'll try to, he has kindly agreed to answer as many questions as possible. Feel free to uh, ask any question to Mr. Sainath. So with this, uh, Mr. Sainath, may I request you to give your uh, take on uh, lockdown, COVID, especially in rural India. Mr. Saina. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, and maybe we should begin by looking at the paradoxes that we are faced with right now. And when we do that, we'll understand that what COVID-19 has done is to perform a tremendous autopsy on our society of the last 28, 30 years. Whatever we've done in the last 28, 30 years in the name of development stands completely exposed in this autopsy. Yeah. It's also given us a brain scan of elite thinking and of how and of media thinking. Consider the first of the paradoxes. Today, we have 82 million tons of food grain, which the government calls surplus or the buffer stock. I prefer calling it buffer stock because it's not a surplus. A surplus is something when everybody has had their share. What is left over is the surplus in your family. If all of you have eaten properly, what's left over is a surplus. How do you call this a surplus when there, we have the hungriest population in the world whose hunger is nowhere near met and whose hunger is greater at its greatest in the past 40 years? In the past 40 years, maybe since the 1965 near famine in Bihar and elsewhere, maybe we have not seen this hunger since then, since that time. So you have consider and try understanding this country itself in terms of the paradoxes. We have 82 million tons of surplus food grain and the largest number of hungry people in the world. Is this new? Is it because of COVID? No. In year 2000, we had 63 million tons surplus. Professor Jean Dres, you might have heard of him. Some of you may have listened to him. Uh, Jean Dres calculated that if you took 63 million tons of food grain in the sacks they were in, in the gunny sacks, and place them in a row, single row, it would be one and a half times the distance to the moon. The distance to the moon is 340,000 kilometers or something like that. But if you put 63 million tons, you could go to the moon and back. I think it was the calculation. Um, imagine what you can do with 82 million tons. In June 1st, the figure was actually 104 million tons. Now, on what basis can we justify or rationalize that your population is hungrier than it has been in 40, 50 years and you have stockpiled 104 million tons, currently 82 million tons of food? 
on what moral basis we can justify this. I reject any possibility of an economic basis. That's that's one kind of situation we are facing in the food front. Second, the government announced, re, Prime Minister recently announced that the 5 kgs free food grain would be extended for another three months. Now, I want you to understand who gets this food grain and who doesn't. About 30% of the population do not get it because it's restricted to those under the National Food Security Act. Okay, Only those, the remaining 28, 30% are not eligible for it. How on earth can you at the time of great hunger, and then of course, there's that whole population without ration cards. There's a whole population without proper identification. Now, this is the most astonishing thing that India is in the worst 10 countries in the global hunger index. And we have been falling further and further in that index. How do you do it when you have such huge, you know, uh, huge harvests and huge yields and a very significant availability of food grain? Think about it. Is the problem COVID-19 or is the problem are inequalities which stand the traditional class, caste, gender inequalities, economic inequalities, which have been further sharpened by the lockdown that has simply smashed the livelihoods of millions of people. We need to ask ourselves this question and think about it. Second, the migrants. You know, I, I of so many of you are journalism students or of other social sciences. I offer you an exercise. Get on to your, do a, a, a post-mortem of the last 10 years of your television channel that you watch or the newspapers that you read. Show me one program, one program, one television program dedicated to migrant laborers in the commercial private television that dominates young viewers. What is that? Where where did you have a discussion? Where did you hear the word migrant laborers? We keep asking ourselves the question, and it is typical of middle class hypocrisy. We ask the we are so worried, so concerned. Why have the migrant laborers left the cities and gone back to the village? Wrong question. The correct question is, why did they leave the villages and come here in the first place? What drove them out? For 30 years under different governments, we followed the same policies that devastated and tanked agriculture in this country, leading to more than 3,15,000 farmers committing suicide in 21 years, 22 years, according to the National Crime Records Bureau. These are not my numbers. Those are the Home Ministry's numbers. And it has been uniform through whichever governmental formation has been there in those past, in those past 22 years when these suicides have occurred. Then you come to the question of, why did they leave the villages? They, what happened? Livelihoods were destroyed in millions. Incidentally, those of you who are students should know, please understand, agrarian is not the same thing as agriculture. Agrarian is much larger than agriculture. Cultivators, farmers, main cultivators form a very small portion of the country, actually. You, I hear learned economists from Niti Ayog and uh, Columbia University, you know them, you know their names, talking about 53% of the Indian population being farmers. Full-time farmers are less than 8% of the population. Part-time and marginal farmers, you'll get another 
you add farm laborers, you'll get 22%. But the census defines a full-time farmer as main cultivator. A main cultivator, you should know this, is someone who spends at least 180 days in a year operating a plot of land. The census is a very generous definition. It does not narrow down things to size of land holdings. It does not qualify farmer on the basis of gender. That is our social failing that we treat only men as farmers. The census of India is far more benevolent and generous in its definition. It does not look at the size of your land holding. It looks at whether you have worked on, cultivated, operated a piece of land for 180 days or more. Then there are those who have done for three months, less than six months. Those you call the marginal cultivators and so on, different categories. The number of main cultivators in your country fell by 15 million, 150 lakhs between the 1991 census and the 2011 census, which means you were losing main cultivators at the rate of 2,040 a day for 20 years on average. Where did they go? Many of, many of them became migrants. Many more fell from the ranks of farmers to the ranks of agricultural laborers. So if you look at the census figures and tables, as the farmers column is plummeting, agricultural workers column is shooting up. So there's been a loss of status, a loss of income, a loss of land, a tremendous calamity has hit the countryside. But we are only talking about crisis in terms of the crisis you and I are experiencing because we have lost our Naukars and Gulams. Please be introspective about this. How much of our own personal self-interest drives our compassion? Hmm? We never, where today the amount of com compassion and concern I see over migrant laborers, how I wish we had seen that when 3,15,000 farmers committed suicide. That was a crisis. That was the crisis that created your migrant laborers on that scale because migrations were highest between 2001 and 2011 if you look at the 2011 census. So know who you are as a society. Know where these migrants came from. Why did they leave? That tells us something about us, not about them. Why did they leave? Because they know, they knew that we would do nothing for them. Yeah, We held them in their ghettos. We sprayed them with disinfectant. We lati charged them and shot rubber pellets to keep them confined in their slums. And yet they came out in millions. To, and it's also a state of our society that no one knows how many migrants there are in this country. The census does not capture the full figures of short term migrations, circular migration. It only captures long range migrations and people and it treats migrations as a one stop journey. Kalahandi to Mumbai. But a person may have gone to 30 places before he comes here. We have no knowledge of the footloose migrants, the most vulnerable, who move without any concrete destination. They don't know where they will be one month from now. That is the class that has grown biggest since 2000, year 2000. We don't know. Their hunger, their problems are so huge. What also stands exposed? is the dismantling of the welfare state by government after government after government, not just one government, but everyone. We destroyed what little public health system we had, we destroyed. It was not a great one ever, but we destroyed it. And in the last budget, the government announced that district level hospitals would be auctioned off to private management. It was open for private management's to apply to take over district level hospitals. Now today, look, look at the racketeering of the private hospital industry. 
look at the rack. I, I live in an area in Mumbai, a very privileged area, in close proximity to three five-star hospitals. Hmm? Each of them is charging 6,500 rupees or more for a COVID test. And other diseases, no chance. A lot more people are probably dying of non-COVID diseases, of lack of treatment of diabetics, diabetes, of stroke, of tuberculosis, who are unable to get treatment. And the hospitals say no beds available unless, of course, you put up a lakh or two lakhs of rupees, then the bed becomes available. We are looking at our face as a society. We are looking in the mirror at ourselves, the kind of inequalities, the kind of exploitation that we indulge in as a society that we are looking at fair and square. Even now, there is no thinking about the migrants. Give you an example. On May 12th, the government passed a fatwa. Okay. Curfew from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. No individual movement allowed. When millions of people were on the highways in the middle of May, you were decreeing that they have to walk in the hottest month, in the hottest period between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. because you have curfew from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Imagine that we are telling people in the middle of summer in May that you will walk in 43, 45 degrees heat. You cannot walk at night. And the order says no individual movement except for essential services. Okay, So people had to walk in the broad daylight. In Chhattisgarh, there is a young girl called Jamlo, 12 years old. This is even before the fatwa came. She, she was working in the chilly fields of in Telangana, in Nalagonda district in Telangana. When the lockdown came without warning, without preparation, a nation of 1.3 billion people was asked to shut down in four hours. A former senior, one of India's most senior IAS officers, G. Deva Sahayan, who was also in the, a major in the army before he joined the IAS, he became chief secretary in Tamil Nadu. He is one of the most senior living IAS officers in the country. And he recalls from his days in the army. He says, even an infantry brigade, a small infantry brigade, is given more than four hours notice before going into action. But 1.3 billion people were given four hours to shut down the country. The chaos had to result. Chaos had to result from that. And anyway, so the chilly fields of Telangana came to a halt, like all fields everywhere. The landlord told the workers, go home, go back to Chhattisgarh. So they walked back to Chhattisgarh. This 12-year-old child, in three days and nights, she walked 140 kilometers in three days and fell dead from exhaustion 60 kilometers from her mother and father's home in Chhattisgarh. Where do we think about this? Where are we worrying about? Do we think for them at all or do we think for ourselves? All the rules and all these things made are made with a view to making life easier for the elite classes and the middle classes. Had we done any thinking and planning, Jamlo would not have died. So that's on the migrations. Nobody knows how many numbers there were in the migrations. On March 31st, the government in the Supreme Court said not a single migrant laborer is on the highways or the streets. Twelve days later, government told the Supreme Court more than a million of them are there and many shelters are being built. If there was no one on the highway, why did you build shelters? And incidentally, 68% of all the shelters were in the single state of Kerala. That's one state, not UP Bihar. There was nothing in those states. 
Then we had on May 1st, finally, one and a half months into the crisis, the Shramik trains. On May 28th, the government of India, which had told the Supreme Court not a single migrant laborer on March 31st was on the street, was proud to announce that 9.1 million migrant laborers 91 lakhs had been transmitted, had been transported on the Shramik trains, by which time another 8, 10 million had gone home by other means. We are talking about the movement of more than 2 crore people, maybe twice that number. We are talking about more people moving than perhaps at the time of partition. This is a gigantic happening in our history. It's a gigantic happening. In our, in our existence as a nation, and what exactly are we focusing on? So you now remember that these people came to the cities and to other towns and to other villages because their livelihoods were destroyed in the villages. Today we are sending them back to the villages where there are no livelihoods, which we destroyed in the last twenty-eight years. That's what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about. We should now multiply the size of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, not by 3,000 crore or four. You have to expand that program sixfold to tenfold to be able to cope with the chaos. That's the thing. You ought to be able to declare no ration card, no biometrics, no other is required. For people who are in hunger, you'll get your five kgs. In fact, it ought to be more than five kgs. You have 82 million tons surplus lying there. You cannot say, I don't have the food. Instead, look at the way we think again as a nation, the elite and middle class sentiments that go into our interests that go into making policy. On April 12th, it was announced that the cabinet had approved conversion of the rice surplus stocks. No cap, no limit. It could be lakhs of tons. It could be millions of tons of rice would be converted into ethanol. For what would it be converted into ethanol? Because you need ethanol to make hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. So my dears, you're going to just imagine what a Kafkaesque situation it is. We are going to destroy millions of tons of food grain when people are in great hunger. We are taking food and destroying it to make it ethanol and fuel. I just, I cannot fathom this method of thinking. I cannot fathom who is doing this thinking or is there any thinking at all? I know the one beneficiary. I know there are 128 beneficiaries of that uh, action. There are 128 grain distilleries that are going to be the beneficiaries of that action because they do the conversion into ethanol for alcohol. They will be given the job of conversion. I haven't read one editorial in a newspaper. I haven't read all the newspapers reported it. They said this will be done. Not one of them thought to ask, what is the sense of destroying food in a time of hunger? That's it. Then we have the Kharif crop. The Rabi crop is lying in the fields unsold, all the cash crop, cotton, 80 lakh quintals lying unsold in the country. And instead of taking note of this, farmers in Punjab and Haryana are switching to cotton from paddy. Lakhs of tons of sugarcane are lying in Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, unsold. And we are going to grow the same thing again in Kharif. We will not be able to export it because globally income and consumption have collapsed. Okay. Now each and, uh, and who do you think was our major export market last year for cotton? More than half our cotton exports, which was about 50 lakh bales. More than half our cotton exports went to China. Are you going to be able to export a single bale to China this year? 
some thinking is required. We needed to intervene as a society, as a state, as a nation, and give the farmers free inputs to grow food crop. We needed to do that. We needed to give them free and let them grow local food crops. Bajra, Jawar, millets, which take much less water than paddy. This is what we needed to do. Now, all these, if all these sectors were are crumbling under this impact, it has to have its impact on education also. How can it not have it? Uh, of course, now the entire buzz is about online education. And then there are the issues of what do you do with the degree that you get now? I want to tell you guys one thing. You know, my, you are having, if you, if you really want to understand, you are being given by COVID-19, by the lockdown, you are being given an education, a social education about your nation, your society that money cannot buy. If you reflect and engage with the world around you, I understand many of you are journalism students, but the same applies to students of the social sciences as well. Engaging with your society, engaging with your nation, engaging with the community at this time will give you a more powerful education than any advanced degree can. You know, I my, one of my favorite sayings, Mark Twain, and it's a saying I lived by, in my college days when I spent much of the 70s, 19, late 1970s getting suspended or expelled from one university campus or the other. My motto was what Mark Twain said. Never let school interfere with your education. Never let the classroom interfere with your education. I, st I have that on my notice board here. Never let school interfere with your education because the world is a, a large, the larger world is the education. I learned that in the days of my studenthood at J Jawaharlal Nehru University campus, how much I learned outside the classroom because there were movements happening all over the country as the emergency collapsed, right? So there is an incredible amount this is the time for you to not be compassionate about the migrant laborer, but to engage with the migrant laborer, to talk to them, to meet them, to walk back with them to where they are going. Try that. Understand what it is to be one of them. Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in the skin. On the other hand, there is a great deal of uh, excitement. You see, you know, there are two principles I always teach my students in journalism, and I've been a journalist, journalism teacher for 35 years. Two principles I teach my students about pursuing your subject and pursuing your story. One is follow the money. It will lead you to why things are happening. Always Nothing happens without somebody making a lot of money out of it. The other principle is check it out. Whatever figures you are given, whatever numbers you are given, whatever facts you are given, check it out. Now, if you look, if you read the business magazines today, they're all on, not in print anymore, they're all on web. And the pink newspapers, the economics newspapers, oof. The most important thing they're salivating over the money that is to be made in online education. Hmm? I want to now this online education. I would love it. You would love it. I don't think actually I don't think a lot of students love it because there is an alienation from the socialization that the classroom gives you. A little boy told our reporter Parth, Parth MN a reporter in Talasari in the Adivasi district. One of the very few young men, one of the very few young men, boys, 
nine years old who owned a smartphone and he he had the smartphone his father was better off but he said he told Parth it's no fun even though I can afford the smartphone even though he could afford the uh, data package he said it's no fun I want to go back to school now we are faced with tremendous dilemmas because we can't risk the children we cannot risk their safety on the other hand let me tell you how online education is going to work on a class caste gender basis let me give you some numbers about how many people in different states including west bengal particularly west bengal because i'm speaking to most of you in west bengal what is the number of rural households in west bengal in maharashtra i'll take five or six states in maharashtra the richest state in the country just 18 and a half percent of rural households have any internet facility one in six people in maharashtra one in six people in rural maharashtra have the ability to use the internet and women in rural Maharashtra, one in 11 women in rural Maharashtra have the ability to use the internet. Just that. One in 11. Yeah. Um, how many households have computers? Here, let me take you, uh, let me come to your own home state. In Maharashtra, one in six people, one, one in six rural Maharashtrians had the ability to use the internet, had the competence or the ability to use it. In rural Bengal, one in 14, one in one four, one in one, 14 rural Bengalis had the ability to use the internet in the 2018 survey of the nation by the National Sample Survey Organization. The Maharashtra figures, West Bengal figures are from the same study. And women, rural women in Bengal, one in 19. How many? One in 19. Just a little over 5% had the ability to use the internet. In urban West Bengal, one in 14 men, uh, one in 14 uh, totally were able to use the internet and women al almost one in five in total total in West Bengal rural and urban combined 7.7 percent or one in 18 were able to use the internet had the competence to use the internet women one in ten also if you look in West Bengal the number percentage of rural households that had computers, not smartphones, the percentage of rural households in West Bengal that had computers was 3.3% of households. 33 96.7% had no computers in the 2018 study. How many had internet facility in rural Bengal? Huh? Rural households, 3.3% had computers. 7.9% had an internet facility. In urban Bengal, that goes up to 23 and 36%. Overall, overall in West Bengal, 9.4% of households had computers and 16.5% households had internet facility. Now just consider that uh, it's, it's astonishing how many people were already excluded as we see it in the People's Archive of Rural India. <clears throat> what is the digital, what was known as the digital divide is now becoming what a teacher in Maharashtra has called the digital partition. 
we have partitioned the rich and the poor. There is a partition now from digital divide to digital partition. Understand this, the, the sufferings of the migrant laborers, the sufferings of rural India are far greater because of the inequalities of Indian society. The, uh, um, the inequalities that have deepened further with the lockdown. So, you know, uh, how many children, how many children up to primary level own smartphones? How many children own smartphones? What about all those kids who go to government schools who are lucky to have a blackboard, who are lucky to have a blackboard, let alone um, a computer? You could do other things. There are other ways. Teachers, unions, teachers, uh, progressives in the teachers have suggested that the reach of television is far greater than the reach of the, you know, of smartphones in the countryside. Why not a government start a channel, a teaching channel, and far more children will be able to access and view it because television has far greater penetration in the countryside than the net and net facilities. So that's that's another thing that you need to think of. Uh, also, let's look at uh, uh, let's look at the practice of teaching in a uh, practice of teaching in a classroom versus the practice of teaching. Little questions were put to us, put to our reporter by girls, little girls, age eleven and ten. If it's an online class, her brother has a smartphone, who is sixteen years old. He reluctantly shares it with her. Then they have to download PDFs for her and they have to go for a higher data package. They have to go for a higher data package. Right now, they're already paying 200 rupees a month for 2 GB a day. And they have to go into the 350 rupees bracket or something like that. Where do they have the money? What kind of income do they have? What kind of earnings do farmers and laborers have? A, one of the laborers who bought a smartphone for his son, he earns 250 rupees to 300 rupees a day at his best times of the year. So he bought a smartphone for 7,500 rupees, paid for it in several installments. Paid for it in several installments. Um, and what he paid for that smartphone was equal to one month's earnings in his best month of the year. Hmm. Then you've got to pay for the data package. How many Indians are able to afford this? Could we not approach through different methods in, you know, could we not approach through television? Could we not approach through distribution of textbooks? Maharashtra has tried that. Dist uh, school teachers are getting the textbooks to a central point and parents are correcting the textbooks. But what it tells us is how inadequate our education infrastructure was in the first place. How inadequate, how bankrupt our education system was that it was entirely, entirely anti-poor. It was made for the rich. You know, as a reporter and a journalist, if I'm, when I go out as I do, 270 days a year, if I want to speak to Dalit students, if I want to speak to Adivasi students, where do I go? I go to the government school. If I want to speak to OBC students, richer OBCs, I want to speak to upper caste students, where do I go? Private school. We have already implemented Varanashra Dharma in the schooling system as we have in the government employment system. Years. Remember the four Varnas and four classes of employees, class one, class two, class three, class four. We have introduced that system of unequal division everywhere. And if you get into 
the gender part of it uh excuse me one second this thing is going to collapse this thing then sonia it was really great to hear mr sainath and starting from as we began that uh, having him and not to discuss on uh, the rural impact in the rural areas of uh, lockdown and uh, covid so we had uh, we had listened to him and then uh, the education system yes mr sainath kindly carry the, on so the, the thing is that you actually ought to have had all the time and i've been begging for it on my knees for 20 years you need look at look at the people who founded this country what was their idea and understanding of an education system the what was known as the gandhi commission in the 1940s headed by sarvapalli radhakrishnan who later became president of india they said free india should never spend never spend less than 10% of plan on education so they were not saying spend 10% they were saying never less than 10% in the next 70 years we never did that we never did that. our best was 3 in the first plan we went we scored a very high 7 8% or something like that subsequently it fell with every plan and today what i don't know for the past 30 years amartya babu has been saying minimum 6.5% you know of gdp should be on education you have never crossed 3.5% center states put together all of us put together you need and by the way building a gigantic education system would also mean a huge employment consider that in a rural school today in most parts of the country whether maharashtra whether bengal one teacher one classroom five class five different classes of students walking up and down and teaching students from class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 all over the country you find in many government schools that if you had what all of us were privileged to have one classroom one subject one teacher do you know how many lakhs of schools you would have to build do you know how many lakhs of teachers you would have to employ how much that would work into a construction boom how much that would work into other occupations like tailoring for school uniforms for admin and all your and you wouldn't have to fight and shoot people to acquire land any village would give you land happily if you put a decent school on their soil right there are lots of things that you could have done and still can do positively instead of which we are taking a path that is going to lead to further exclusion of poor people particularly dalits and adivasis and girls girls are going to be the worst sufferers even if if you look at smartphone ownership it's statistically a negligible fi- figure in the countryside for children below the age of 16 girls are a statistically negligible figure so you've got all these kinds of problems now what can you guys do you're going to get a degree perhaps in the next few months some of you or in the next two years i will say there are four five things one first and foremost i reiterate what i said engage with your society engage with the world around you learn how, learn about and this is where this is the motto of the people's archive of rural india um the everyday lives of everyday people and i'm very happy to tell you that in the next few days maybe in 2 3 weeks pari is going to come out with a sub domain in a, a, a category in pari pari education so there is your online entirely free of charge we are not byju or un academy an academy yeah we want to engage we want to have you interact with your own people and society 
and we do not believe that is mediated by cost or profit that has to be mediated by our longing to connect with our fellow citizens it has to be driven by that need to know who we are where we are going where we came from yeah and uh, and if you look at if you look at it another way in the one of the unique things about pari education what's going to happen when pari education comes who will be the journalists who will be the writers you will that platform we cover we cover students in another category in another page that's called small world where we as professional journalists cover students in pari education you will write your own textbook you will write for pari and we will carry it according to the merit of its how how much work you've done hundreds of students in st joseph school bangalore in other schools in the country are sending us more material than we can handle to be published on pari education the other thing that i should tell you about pari is that we publish in 13 languages including bengali and our translations program which is the biggest of any indian website is run from west bengal it's run by smita khator in west bengal in kolkata in the lockdown period smita managed to put on translations of 468 articles okay in the different languages so it the same article sometimes but totally coming to 468 translations in this you will one you will engage in the main pari in the non education section with people whom you have never heard of india's last living freedom fighters on july 15th you will see an article in pari on a 99 year old freedom fighter who was inspired was nigh entered the freedom struggle at the age 9 in a village in tamil nadu when he heard of the execution of bhagat singh okay he ran out onto the streets and joined the procession on july 15th he will be 99 years old you need to know this is your country this is the great traditions of your country you need to know who these people are you need to know who the farmers and laborers are the biggest section in the people's archive of rural india is on migrants it's called the rural in the urban that is the migrants in the cities the rural in the urban the largest number of articles we have on any subject is in that the rural in the urban section you should be able to look at that also we want an ongoing engagement with students we want this ongoing engagement with students some of the students have written such terrific stuff for us that we have put it on the main section of pari meaning on par with the adult uh, publications we, we you can move freely between the students se- section and any other section pari has no subscription fee pari does not carry advertising we think there are enough people selling you needless products already why do we have to add to that yeah pari has a library a unique library in pari library you don't borrow books from us we give them to you free you can download them print them out and use them and you don't pay anything for it you have to give us the attribution for your seminar papers your tutorials your exam papers you can download the most important reports of the country from the census of 1871 onwards you can download stuff and use it in your work you can look at the work that other students are doing what they are writing how they have written and i should tell you that a very large number of students from west bengal have interned on pari and done and been at the forefront of one of our most important projects called 
faces. You know, the amount of racism in the country in the last few years with the beating up and even rape of Northeastern students, students from Northeast have suffered fatal beatings in Delhi and fatal beatings and rape in Bangalore and in Delhi also. In 2014, a little bo a young boy from Arunachal Pradesh, Nido Tanya, was beaten to death in the INA market in Delhi. And one of the shopkeepers who beat him told the press why they asked him, did you attack this innocent young fellow? He said, they look Chinese. You know that. So in my mind that day, a question came. So who looks Indian? Is there an Indian face? Yes, there is. There's 1.3 billion of them in sheer diversity. So we started doing a facial mapping of the Indian nation from every block, every, di every district, every block of every state in the country. Hundreds of those photographs came from Vishwabharati, from the students of journalism and uh, communication from and the mass communication. Hundreds, maybe 400, 500 photographs of faces of ordinary people from the blocks and districts of West Bengal. And what was the experience of the students who went out and shot those photographs? Some of them cried to us that we never knew that these people lived like this. They engaged with real, ordinary, everyday people. And it had an impact on their learning, on their consciousness, on their sensibility, on their sensitivity. I would like all of you to do that. Please get on today to People's Archive of Rural India. This is Pari. And you will find the, the URL is Rural India Online. One word. Rural India Online. Dot org. You can click on the language button and you can go to Bengali. Here's another advantage which we give you. No other site gives you and we give it to you free. Those who want to improve their language can read the same article in English, Bengali and Hindi. You know, you want to improve your Hindi. You want to improve your 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 expatriate Bengali who's weak in Bengali but very good in English. You can improve your Bengali because the translations are very high quality and high caliber. Smita presides over this and she has a very strict quality control over everything. Um, so we have people who are, you know, in Marathi students who are weak in English. They read the article in Marathi. They also read it in English and improve that language. So it, it's in many ways, Pari education is going to mean something very special. We cover journalists, cover the students, and the students write for us and cover themselves, cover different subjects. All of this will happen. So my thing is also, we will start having on the Pari education advisory reading lists for the best readings that you can do, right? For the best readings that you can do, things like that. Now, I think I'll stop here and we can get on to the questions if Snehashi Saab can ask me some questions. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I have nothing to say uh, rather than listening to you. I mean, typical interview that I did not want to interrupt and want to pretend that I know and I need to say certain words which I have learned from you over these years. There's no point in that. You have been precise on your topics. You said uh, the rural India migration, education problem, digital divide, and digital partition. And then the Pari experiment we wanted to know so that we can engage more. Uh, I think it is our conscience, it is our uh, ability, and it is our future that we should engage just to know Bharat. We are, you know, we are confined to plus people like us. Okay, we straightway go to the question answer sessions. There have been plenty uh, I don't know how many will be able to answer more or less. We'll have half an hour time because almost we have spent an hour. So we'll have uh, half an hour more. So I'll request uh, Mr. Sainath to answer. Uh, he will decide the length. I will never say anything. I'll just read out the question. The first question is uh, from um, 
Manasi Agarwal. Uh, she asked me, is the Indian media's coverage on the issue of migrant labor a shame? So what is your reaction on India's uh, I mean, coverage of migrant labor's issue? Very briefly, Indian media's coverage of labor per se is a disgrace. Uh, uh, Mansi, I don't know. Maybe you're, if you're a journalism student, you know what beats are in a newspaper, right? The portfolio of a reporter. If Snehashish is on the education beat, that is education is the sector he covers. We call those beats. In 1980, when I joined journalism in the United News of India, Delhi, every major newspaper in this country had a labor beat, yes. had an employment and labor correspondent. Today, not a single newspaper in the country has a full time labor correspondent. That labor correspondent will be doing 10 other things. Many corporate media newspapers, they don't have labor correspondents. They give that portfolio to their business correspondent and call him industrial relations correspondent, like Times of India and others. Okay? They call that person that. So everything is looked at from the perspective of the Malik, the owner, the corporation. As you know, when so there, there is no coverage at all. There is no labor beat that has disappeared. Agriculture beat. We have a, we have several people calling themselves or being called by their newspaper as agriculture correspondents. Actually, what they cover is the agriculture ministry or the agriculture minister. If it was Sharad Pawar, there were people who only covered him in the name of covering agriculture. Now there is another thing that they cover, agribusiness. Oh, they cover Monsanto and they cover uh, Rasi seeds because there there is revenue. There is money. There is advertising. And this was one of the biggest scandals in paid news in which a story which I broke, by the way, on the front page of the Hindu in 2009. And again in 2012, when we showed that a major seed company had actually bought coverage in the country's largest newspaper and was presenting an advertisement as news. Once the same thing was presented later as a news feature, once it was presented as an advertisement. So agribusiness and agriculture ministry get covered. The farmer at the Mandi doesn't get covered. The farmer, the laborer at the time of sowing doesn't get covered. The farm labor at the time of harvest doesn't get covered. So when we don't have people to cover it at all, how can the thing not be a disgrace? You, on the migrant labor, the mainstream, or I hate calling that mainstream media because they exclude the mainstream from the content. In the corporate media, discovered migrant laborers on March 26th. They never had a beat for them. They never had anyone covering them. They had no stories on them. And then suddenly you're asking reporters who have not covered those subjects at all to try and do it. And if they suffer. And anyway, you're not going to allow them to travel much. So you're doing it from the edge of the city. Therefore, the coverage of migrant laborers has to be very poor. Well, but to Mrs. Sainath, I think even the corporate media holds the pictures and also the country got to know about them through at least some presence were seen rather than a total blackout. I, Sneha I don't know. Yeah. I'm not saying there was a total. I'm saying the total blackout came. The total blackout came before the lockdown. Right. There was 40 years of blackout. 30 yes. years of blackout. Huh? Yes. What yes. did I say? I said COVID-19 has done an autopsy. It has done and it has shown you that the blackout of 30 years, what you did not know, what we would not tell readers, what we would not tell viewers is now standing naked before us. This is how you began your discussion. Yeah. Yes. And we come down to that uh, over and over again. So I go to the next question is, do we require any kind of present movement to remove such difference? 
it is by Shikha Shen. Do we require any kind of peasant movement to remove such difference? Shikha Shen. You require peasant movements before COVID and lockdown. You require peasant movements now. You desperately require strong peasant movements in the near future. Hmm. Remember that this that such movements were also gathering some some momentum in 2017-18. They were gathering some momentum in major marches when 40,000 very poor Adivasi, poorest Adivasi farmers marched 182 kilometers from Nashik to Mumbai. Most of them barefoot because they can't afford footwear. They marched 182 kilometers in 38 to 40 degrees Celsius temperatures and hotter because they walked barefoot on the highs and they climbed hills and valleys and came to your meeting in Mumbai. 2018, uh, in, that was in March. And in 2018, November end, you had farmers from 22 states of the country, including prominently from West Bengal, in Delhi, marching on parliament, demanding a special session of parliament. And I'm saying now, I was, I was saying it was my idea. I said three weeks. I'm saying it's got to be a full session of parliament, full session dedicated to the crisis that India is in, agrarian, civilizational, agricultural, social. Yeah, all that has to now. And it's got to be the marginal, the peasantry, the workers who get to speak. We are moving in the opposite direction by cracking down on trade unions, forbidding their activity for a year. States have suspended 38 labor laws. Yeah, and where is the writing about this in the media? So you need, yes, do we need, we need peasant movements. We need workers movements. We need, uh, Shika, we need students movements also. We need students movements. You know, I told you this, that the, uh, uh, on July 15th, you'll see a 99 year old freedom fighter on Pari. He was one of the brightest students in the American college Madurai. He went to prison 15 days before his exams, last exams. He was the founder of the poetry society. He was a star in the football team. And when we asked, what was your thought in your head when your career was destroyed like that? He said, I never thought about anything except that I am very proud to be. I am very proud to be jailed for India's freedom. You know, I think there is some inspiration there for all of us you know, that we have to rise above ourselves in some of this. So, yes, you're right. You need movements. Well, now I come to the question of Mr. Debashish Mojumdar, who asked, uh, is it lack of political will that the agricultural sector, which employs 60% of the working population, contribute only 14% of GDP? Well, you know, the thing is, I think that it's not just a lack of will. I think there was a clear design. Right. See, conventional traditional mainstream economists or rather elite economists. They think in particular ways. They think that agriculture is a useless thing. You know, why should you have 60% of the population in it when 5% can produce the food that is required for the population? Right. After all, in the United States, less than 1% declare themselves as farmers now. And they produce so much food grain. Here's the point. Even an MS Swaminathan has said this repeatedly. Agriculture is not a business. Agriculture is a livelihood. Don't count everything in terms of output. Look at it in terms of the growth and income of the farmer and the farm laborer. That is how you should measure even, even in the Swaminathan Commission report, he makes this point again. Though, of course, it was the National Farmers Commission report of which he was the chair. But he has consistently said this with all my differences with him on a hundred subjects. 
he was always saying this for 20 years that I've known that treat agriculture as a livelihood. It's not a job or a naukri. It's not something that you can switch and do something else tomorrow. Be a clerk in bank one day and be a clerk in reliance another day. Hey, you know, it's a livelihood and you have to see it in terms of livelihoods. So the, the design of economists for the last 28 years in this country was actually how to push people out of agriculture. That was not neglect. It was actively expelling people from agriculture. Please know that the great McKinsey, McKinsey report for Chandra Babu Naidu, Vision 2020. On the first two pages, it says there are too many people in agriculture. We should move 40 percent of them out. And he managed that. And you saw what the people of Andhra Pradesh did to Chandra Babu Naidu. We disrupted the entire agrarian society while we threw people out of livelihoods without an alternative. Did we create a single job? No, in the public sector, you lost 2 million jobs. Hmm? And now you have a hospital system that is completely understaffed, <coughs> an educational system that is severely understaffed and underschooled. We never did what we had to because it was a plan that we should shift everybody out of agriculture. Agriculture is a backward thing. There is a very, it's a very middle class notion agriculture i think there is no more important function in the human race than the production of food and by the way one of the most greatest sayings by perhaps the greatest bengali more than a century ago rabindranath tagore put it so beautifully in one line he said food is a source of Great wealth, food production is a source of great misery because it is the producer who goes hungry. It is that farmer and farm laborer who go hungry. It is they who starve. Therefore, you need an entirely different vision and understanding and idea of agriculture. And by the way, those trends and those ideas exist in your society. If you go to Kerala and look at the Kudumbashri movement, 4.3 million women, including quarter of a million who are running collective farms, little farms, one acre, one hectare, landless women. And they were the only farmers I saw making profits in the last 20 years. Last two years, they've been wiped out by the floods, but they made profits as using the collective strength of the worker. So collective farming is uh, obviously a good remedy. So, the, well, now I come to the question of Mr. Raja Srinivas, who asked, uh, how far does education reach the outline without online facility? But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. How far does education? Well, look at Silicon Valley, Karnataka. Hmm? Let me give you the number of how many people in uh, Silicon Valley of Kar in Karnataka, India's Silicon Valley, 8.3% of rural households have the internet facility. And how many percent of uh, rural households in Karnataka have uh, computers? 2%. 2% of rural Karnataka households have computers. So you see how much, why don't you look at how much online will reach? Hmm. Online, offline, I've already said is a mess. We never invested in agriculture, in education as we should have, though the founding fathers of, look, look at your directive principles of state policy in it, in constitution of India. Hmm. Uh, in the constitution of India, it says, Every child, free and compulsory education up to the secondary level. We never did that. And it said you should do that within 10 years of the adoption of this constitution. That was the direction of the writers of the Indian constitution. We never did that. Okay. So um, it's uh, in every case, 
so the look at if karnataka 2% of rural households have computers what chance of an offline do you have in fact there have been huge protests after which karnataka has put a ban on preschool to class 5 online teaching because everybody gets excluded yeah it's not that the offline teaching is a great thing because we didn't make it a great thing but at least the school can go child can go to school and you know how many millions of parents are every day begging for schools to reopen at least for that midday meal that the child gets which they are not able to provide that is the nature of hunger the next question is uh, from uh, druhi dasgupta who asks that in the context of online education please throw light on the in, emergence of what we we'll, uh, term it a uh, digital divide how can the divide be addressed and what are the alternatives for a uh, reduction of that uh, digital divide you know uh, the digital divide druhi the digital divide is a reflection of the many divides already existing which are being accelerated and accentuated yeah the the fact that only 3% of rural households in west bengal have computers less than 8% of rural bengal had internet facility in 2018 that should, that is a reflection of your class divisions it's a reflection of social deprivation because you will find within those 2% there will be absolutely negligible percentage of dalit and adivasi households so the many inequalities of india will also affect the digital divide now let me give you one figure on inequality in india pre covid in 1991 because all our policies were directed at building greater inequality on the trickle down theory that if you make the rich richer they will create employment they will create jobs nothing of that sort ever happened in an era where technology is automatically used to reduce jobs okay now uh, in 1991 when we began the new economic policies there was not a single dollar billionaire in india not one we didn't exist on the forbes billionaires list if there was a list at that time in year 2000 we had 8 dollar billionaires in year 2018 we had 121 dollar billionaires the fourth ranking nation in the world the fourth ranking nation in the world after the united states china and germany and our 121 billionaires their wealth was equivalent according to forbes to 22% of india's gross domestic product 121 individuals in a population of 1.3 billion controlled wealth equivalent to 22% of our gdp i don't see where you can go from there except closer to the edge of the abyss that kind of inequality ensures that nothing will ever happen for the poor right and that is the kind of inequality that now stands exposed in every single sector so what is called a digital divide was a reflection to start with of the class caste gender divides you can see how badly off girls women to women are very badly off in the digital divide and young girls are victimized in the in the online education because how many young girls in rural bengal do you know who owns smartphones tell me that or anywhere i can tell you about other states now in fact a very progressive teacher in maharashtra has coined a new term he says this is earlier it was digital divide and i said that now he says it is digital partition we've drawn a boundary wall a border that people cannot cross so that is a reflection of the growing rapidly deepening inequalities of indian society 
So next question is from uh, Sayani Chakraborty who has asked that the online education system is affecting on the mental health of the students who are by no choice are the part of the people who does not have an internet facility. Is it way of seeding inequality among them? What is your view about it? Is it a way of? Seeding inequality, as you, you, which you were saying already. I've already said, but I'll just, I'll add this little bit that, you know, uh, there are, see the mental health issues that are coming up, are coming up all over the world because the lockdowns, see, we are not used as human beings to that kind of extended isolation unless we go to prison for something. Yeah. And the kind of isolation is having a serious impact. It's having an impact on you and me and all of us. The kind of fa fact that 90% of the things we would be doing normally, we are unable to do. Right. So that, I think the sense of isolation has a very bad effect on those who have already existing, pre-existing mental health issues. And this is a society where we don't talk openly about mental health issues because we and we we equate mental health problem with criminal insanity you know i mean it's it's absolutely absurd but that's what we do in it was that way 30 years ago in all societies of the world we still live in that space so that is a big issue it is a very big problem and the seething inequality will only heighten the isolation when you know, and also little questions that little girls have asked in the class. If I'm, if it's an online class, a little thing in Talasri, Adivasi, she says, if there's an online class and I raise my hand to ask a question, will the teacher see me? What answer do we give her? What answer do we give them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the next question is from uh, Shayanton Mondol, who says that you spoke about uh, uh, utilizing television as a mode of education, but uh, he has to say that uh, it's not interactive. So how do you uh, go about it? You know, I'm not recommending television as a mode, mode of education. I'm saying that it has a greater reach and penetration in the rural areas. And whether it's interactive or not, I'm not so sure that online education as it is practiced now is interactive. That's what that girl was asking. If she is sitting with one small, primitive, cheapest model, small smartphone, which she has borrowed from her father for the class, she really wants to know, will the teacher see me if I want to ask a question? Okay. So how interactive it is depends on how well off you are and how much gizmo you have and how much you can demand from the teacher, whereas in government schools, the teachers themselves very often do not have computer facilities at home. Right. So I'm saying I'm not suggesting for a moment that we switch to I'm saying we have to do many things. Kerala, see, I'm saying that the teachers unions have suggested that it is three steps ahead of the online uh, uh, teaching because simply because it reaches a hell of a lot more people than others. That's there. I'm not an advocate of it. I'm saying that I would rather reach more people. And if this is, should be one method, um, sub, you need many methods supplementing each other. So the next question is from Oenri Dash, who says that since you have been discussing on online education and you have already discussed uh, television as a mode, but now she wants to know what about radio, the utilization of radio as a means of spreading education. Absolutely. I think, see, radio is a wonderful medium, underused. And however, the when the government started letting the private sector into the, the it's interesting, it happened with the UPA and Congress government. When they started letting in the private sector, it was the same corporate giants of the print media who captured FM radio. The Times of India, the Hindustan Times, Midday. Okay. 
Now, community radio, it is much harder to start a community radio station than a private corporate radio station. Try getting the license for it. If we could do that, if we could have a situation where every school network in a district could have its radio station, you'd have, we are trying to do this, by the way, to some extent in Pari, when we get on to online radio, online podcasts, when we get on to that, we are trying to do what you are thinking of. And I would think, by the way, I think that All India Radio is an incredibly powerful medium if we can use it properly. I mean, who else has archives of music in 104 languages? Nobody else. Nobody else has that. Right? So you have a powerful, powerful treasure house there in radio. I agree with you. I would love to see it used more. Uh, the next question by Jilani Sheikh and the next to next is from Sangeeta Chakrabarti. They also said that use a radio and use a podcast. So I'm not repeating the question. This has already been answered, but I want to congratulate them for their participation in uh, asking this question. So uh, next question is from Sheetal Birazdar. If inequality is root cause of all problems, what is the solution on reducing inequality? Is an uh, uh, question. Most fundamental question. And uh, by the way, everywhere in the world in the last 10 years, when you know, when 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when some of us were saying inequality is the biggest problem, we were subjected to a great deal of ridicule. The Brookings Institution came with a paper saying the debate, the, this is a debilitating debate over inequality. Inequality is a good thing. Many, many economists started saying inequality produces competitive spirit as people want to better themselves. And it's the spirit of competition that drives human society forward. Yeah, we've seen where it has driven human society. You have seen that, the kind of divides and position. So, that inequality which I spoke about between 121 individuals, statistically, you can't can calculate what their percentage is in 130 crore people. That kind of inequality, do you know, are you aware, Sani, that your constitution commits this nation to fighting inequality? And it says how? Tell me something. Uh, the I am saying that the framework of approaching any of the problems now is entirely different from the frameworks pre-COVID and pre-think. They will not work. You know, I hear every day debates on when can we get over this problem and go back to normal? And I keep saying normal was the problem. Uh, what what was normal for you and me? Was it normal for the migrant laborer? Was it normal for the toy makers of Murshidabad? Was it normal for the agricultural laborer of Bihar? Was it normal for the domestic servant, the woman coming from Pune and working in houses in Mumbai? It was never there. Our normal was their nightmare. Now we are having to share their nightmare and therefore we recognize it. The way to fighting that inequality is there in your constitution. The Indian constitution, which to my mind is one of the most remarkable documents on earth, has a particular section. But before I come to that, I'm saying what framework should we approach problems in? Single line. The only framework from here on is not inclusive, inclusive development or exclusive development or smart cities or higher investment in something. The from here on, all our problems have to be addressed to the through the prism of justice, 
of justice. Okay, food justice. It's a concept, by the way. Kudumbashree in Kerala swears on the principle of food justice, which is the producer shall never go hungry. Yes, justice. Is another another concept coming up. Another concept gaining ground is health justice. There is the issue of social justice. Please read those words in your constitution. Equality and justice for all, social, economic, and political. What does your preamble say? Justice for all, social, economic, and political. And I don't think it was an accident that they used the word social first. This, that's in your preamble. Your constitution was the product of your freedom struggle by people who fought for equality. They didn't fight for equality with the British. They fought for equality for all Indians. Not just they were not seeking equality with the empire, but with all. And then you come to that unique chapter of the Indian constitution. I only know Irish constitution and Indian constitution have this chapter, the directive principles of state policy. The right to food, the right to work, the right to shelter, the right to health. And of course, there will be smart young lawyers who will tell you it's these are not justiciable rights. Please read three judgments in the Supreme Court of India in the last year. Three judgments in the Supreme Court of India in the last 40 years, including the last one by Justice Ashok Ganguly of West Bengal, where they say the directive principles of state policy are as important as the fundamental rights of the Indian constitution. They all, and the constitution itself says these rights may not be justiciable, but they must nonetheless inform the governance and policy of this country. They say that the constitution uses those words. We should it should be part of our struggle for justice to make those justiciable rights enforceable rights. And then you will see how you can solve those problems with the right to work, the right to if you look, if you look at the em emphasis on employment rather than the emphasis on em unemployment insurance, you'll make a great make a great difference. Well, all good things should come to an end. And uh, we had a target of uh, 7.30. And now we have crossed the target by three minutes. Uh, I don't want to uh, recapitulate. I have no intention of doing it. But there are certain points uh, as a takeaway. The inequality you spoke at length. We should understand at least the present generation. And everyone should understand the inequality. And... Uh, as you said, that the best thing to learn is to go and meet the fellow citizens, go to the rural areas, live with them and to learn the experience. That is something which is very important. And obviously, the age old question of state's expenditure on education and health that needs to be increased and the pre COVID situation. And now, uh, well, which was normal, it is to be determined, but things have changed. And obviously, education, there is a big challenge uh, in a big country like India. It, it, it will take some time to you know, solve this problem. And the agricultural, uh, the area of agriculture, the, the, the producer should not remain hungry. And the surplus food and the hungry people and the migrant laborers, uh, their problems and uh, their issues, at least. These are the things which, uh, as uh, you began by COVID has done an autopsy and let us get the report of the autopsy and try to learn and rectify ourselves, even the next generation, present generation, everyone. And there must be a, a mindset to address these issues. Uh, obviously, uh, I need to uh, name a couple of persons whose questions could not be asked, like Dr. Shourab Gupta of uh, Central University in Koraport, and uh, he is a professor of journalism. Shourab, we are very sorry. Muhammad uh, Zakirullah Khan, uh, Shomik Chatterjee, Shudha Sri Dash, uh, Deepa Rani, 
সায়ন কান্তি মন্ডল রেশমি নস্কর অ্যান্ড প্রগতি সম্রানি আই এম সরি মেনি অফ দেম আর কোয়াইট ওয়েল নোন ইন দ্য মিডিয়া এডুকেশন ফ্রন্ট আই এম সরি দ্যাট অল কোয়েশ্চেন্স কুড নট বি অ্যাড্রেসড অ্যান্ড আই থিঙ্ক উইল হ্যাভ অপরচুনিটিজ ইন ফিউচার অ্যান্ড বাট অন বিহাফ অফ ধি কাস্ট and on my personal behalf uh, i would like to it's not a formality that i need uh, to thank mr sainath uh, but you know it's very enriching experience for all of us you know to to change our mindset to to help us in introspect that what we need to see as a person as a media person and uh, i would like to thank debayon the key person in uh, the director of the communication and the management of opc private limited team the cast which includes oprateem onkita goirik shayani and sudipto the cast is thankful to indrila and sanjali for handling the backstage job seamlessly keep listening to the cast especially the new initiative everyday lives of everyday people in collaboration with pari they are doing it on behalf of the pari and i believe again uh, i personally thank the cast and i personally thank many others at least to someone who did not want to figure in but i know how important uh, that person was uh, in organizing this but uh, obviously we don't want to name that person not even disclose the gender but uh, that's why i'm not referring to as she or he uh, we all understand but uh, obviously and uh, the the communication i would again uh, say that uh, you know uh, there are young students pass outs of communication and they are on a digital platform and uh, they are doing something on their own and in the covid days uh, these things have gone up and i i appreciate your initiatives you are not uh, searching for jobs which are not very easy now you are doing it and your trust is rural india you are tie up with pari and all others uh mr saina uh, i think uh, i i i i don't dare to thank you it is your conviction for you out of your conviction you have been here to steer our uh, inner feelings so that we get a different eyes to look and uh, different uh, fingers to write and different tongue to speak uh even we are communicators or as a citizen we need to look into it with difference not only confine ourselves to people like us this is bharat and we are committed to because the food we get it is da- I mean, pr- produced by them so we have a commitment let's see how your uh discussion uh, your words have changed how many minds i believe this will be present on the web and uh, we will get to listen to it watch it uh, repeatedly to uh, enlighten us uh, time and again well all good things should come to an end namaskar to mr sainath namaskar to all thank you namaskar.